Many years ago, I adapted this glitter lamp to take a GU10 LED lamp, and initially I used a hydroponic lamp with, I think it's got one blue chip and two red chips. And over time I expected the red to hold its strength, but the blue gallium nitride LEDs to fade, and that's exactly what's happened. So I think it's time to open that lamp and change the blue LED chips. Let's go to the bench and do that right now. So here is the glitter lamp in question. I have to say, I've just realized that this has been running 24 seven for eight years, eight years continuously. So it's not surprising the lamp is degraded. I'm surprised it's not exploded because that's how these often fail. Maybe it's close to exploding, who knows? But anyway, starting off with the glitter lamp itself, this is, a, I think it's calcium nitrate it's based on. And it was an original glitter lamp in this vial with this base. But I uh, filtered it and I removed the original chunky glitter and I replaced it with Roscoe Scenic Glitter, which is incredibly precise optically. And interestingly, I've made calcium nitrate lamps since then, but when I use the Roscoe Glitter, it eats the metallization of it. What could they have done to this? If this is calcium nitrate, they would have stopped it um, corroding the aluminium off the mylar like that. Could, could there be a corrosion inhibitor in it? Or is it even not calcium nitrate? Who knows? But anyway, here's the bit that we're interested in. This is a lamp, and if I plug this into the hoppy, it shows, oh, that is bright. It shows that the power consumption is just over two watts, which is probably why it's lasted so long. Terrible power factor, 0.45, that's normal, 19 milliamps. And if I point this now at the bench, it doesn't look too bad, but the blue has definitely faded. The, the gallium nitride was normally much more efficient and uh, put out a lot more light. So when this light started off, it was predominantly blue with just a smattering of red in it. And I fully expected the blue to fade over time and the red to maintain its intensity because the gallium arsenide red LED chips are much more rugged and reliable. They hold their intensity better than that. So let's unplug it and get the hoppy out of the way. Take the lamp out. This is where it's actually quite hard getting that lamp and it's really not designed for it. There's the GU10 holder I put in ages ago. It takes a lot of fumbling to get the lamp to sit into it. So I'll put this stuff out of the way. Make sure I don't stand in the plugs. Standing in British plugs is a terrible experience. They're very pointy. I shall grab a screwdriver and we'll start getting into this. So I shall zoom down it. It's the standard construction. The base isn't too hot. Then again, I've not had it on for very long, so that would explain why it's fairly cool. Yes, that's logical. But it uses this standard recipe here that it's got a metal front plate and then three separate lenses over the LEDs. And when you take the front plate off, the LEDs drop out, revealing a circuit board inside with the LEDs, that one is discolored, the blue one, it's obviously discolored. Uh, am I gonna be able to get that out of there? Have I glued this in? What is that? The, the heat sink compound is actually crept in here. I think I might open the base, that is the heat sink compound. I didn't know it did that. But anyway, this should not be anchored in. This should literally just be sitting in. It should be stuck in the compound. So I should be able to pop it out. I have been able to pop it out. This is good. I'm absolutely flabbergasted that this thing has been lit for so long. It's provided stunning performance. So I'm going to take these three screws out here that hold it onto the base. I just want to see what the power supply is like inside the base. I may desolder the circuit board, the LEDs in it, just to uh, do the tests. The power supply looks, is it discharged? Finger, yes, it's discharged. Uh, it's got a little ceramic capacitor on the output, so that's why it's been, it's not had the usual capacitor feel on that side. The input capacitor I think will be fine because it's not running too hot and the input capacitors on the main side are not that stressed. Is this a bright power chip? It probably is a bright power chip. Most of them were from that era. BP9022, yes. Their data sheet's notable for saying confidential, do not share. Right, tell you what, I'm going to de so well, oh, the soldier arm's on. Let's do that right now. Pink wire in the middle. Uh, the other wire is out next to the capacitor. Right here, oh, I shall remember that. He lied. 
So I'll take that off so I can get the circuit board out. It smells slightly hot electronic -y smell. The red LEDs look dark, but they're fine. Here's the rogue uh, blue LED. Let's see if we can get that off by heating up this pad and then lifting it. Might work, might not. Oh, uh, of course, this is, of course, an uh, aluminum coarse heat sink. So not so great for getting LEDs off. Okay, and there's a little dab of heat sink underneath. Did I put LEDs into this myself? I think it was the commercial product. Uh, I might put this into a vice just to make this easier for me to work on. That would be a good idea. I shall put all the little screws over there. One thing I've discovered with these lights is that many of them, the aluminum frame is supposed to press down on the reflectors and the reflectors then press onto the LEDs that then press this against the back plate. I've found in many of them that uh, the uh, LED, the front doesn't hold it quite perfectly. There's looseness and it doesn't make a perfect connection. What was I looking for here? I was looking for my vice. I'm still looking for my vice. There's my vice. A vice from a pillar drill. So let's open this up. I'm now tempted to change the red LEDs too, but having said that, I don't think I need to... I think they're still amply fine in output. Uh, and I also don't think I've got any of the red LEDs because I only tended to have some of the more interesting blue LEDs in that format. I could be wrong. I haven't bothered looking, so that's uh, a bit sloppy. Where's my desoldering wick? There's the soldering wick. I shall add some flux to it and try my best to get some of this solder off here. So I shall add some of this flux onto the strip. The tiny little needle in this tends to block up a bit, but with a bit of pressure, suddenly the stuff squirts out. Let's see if we can mop this off. I've just soldered the braid onto the circuit board. That's not bad, actually. That's not bad. Now, polarity-wise, I would uh, expect... Well, uh, I should mark this, shouldn't I? Let's get some isopropanol and clean that as well. It's a bit grubby. So here's a cotton bud and some isopropanol, which dissolves flux. And I shall just give this a quick smoosh round here. It's not cleaning very well. Cruddy old flux from previous manufacturing, perhaps. That's strange how the solder resist, not solder resist, what am I talking about here? I'm just all over the place here. The heat sink compound, which tends to be sort of an oil base, like silicon oil, and a zinc oxide, I think it is, it's crept everywhere. That is bizarre. Why has it done that? There will be a scientific reason for that. Right, tell you what, where's the meter? I shall put the meter to diode test. Because although it won't actually register a diode, it will show continuity between here and this polarity. So that is positive and this is negative. Where is a red pen? I shall put a dot here. There is a nasal inhaler that's just decided to invade the shot for some reason. Not that I really need nasal inhalers very often. Although having said that, the... Wintry season is approaching and it might be quite useful, although when you've got a smashed up nose it doesn't really matter anyway because uh, it's not really going to clear smashed up nose. I shall get a screwdriver, which is an inappropriate tool for the job, and I shall put a dab of the heat sink paste under there on that. It'll be good to get this going again. And I shall use a generic cheap uh, from high quality electronics. Yeah, right. Uh, polarity. These things often have a little uh, indent in them to show polarity. And it's not going to light very bright on this. Uh, hold on, let's try it the other way around. So this is the positive at this side. Let's put a little red dot there, because it helps. And then I shall 
flow some soda onto that. On, say for instance, I shall do the negative first. And I'll put a wee touch of soda in the bottom. And a matching touch of soda here. Noting that this is one of these uh, Iron Man Core PCBs, and that doesn't help a lot. That makes it quite tricky. I'm going to have to really blast into the soda iron after I've got this in position. And then I shall loosely position the LED there. And flow the soda. Hopefully that soda will flow because, well... Oh, it's, it's going... It's going... And I'll turn this round to make it easier. Hopefully that is roughly lined up where the lens is going to fit, though I don't think it really matters that much. If anything, it may even be viable to get rid of the lens completely. Um, and I shall put a little bit of soda on here, nudge that into position, because it's not quite in position. It is now. And theoretically, if I get my bench power supply and creep the voltage up, and I put the negative on there, and the positive on there, I turn it on, it's on at a low voltage, and then gradually creep the voltage up. Yeah, that's looking pretty good so far. That is looking pretty good, is it not? Right, tell you what, I'm going to assemble this together again. Um, and I'll pause momentarily while I do that, otherwise it's going to end up a very long and boring video. But basically speaking, I'm going to put more compound in there. I'm going to screw this back on first after putting the wires through and soldering them on again. I'll put some more compound, maybe clean this out. This is disgusting. Yeah, that's intriguing. If you get any idea of why the, uh, the stuff has flowed, then let me know. It's not something I've really spotted that much in the past. That is bizarre. I'll give this a clean out. Okay, so tell you what, I'll be back in a moment while I do that. One moment, please. And resume. So the only problem I had with this lamp there, well, so far, it might be more problems, was the plastic of the base had actually degraded to the point that putting the screws in, I only managed to get two in, and the other one kind of just basically snapped one of the pillars, but that's not uncommon. Now, at this point, I'm going to have to try and get this lamp back in here. Normally, to get it in, I poise it upside down in the base, and I try and get it in. If it doesn't go in... Oh, it's just gone in. Righty up. Well, that solves that problem. Let's bring the hoffy up. This is assuming that this thing isn't just going to explode. Here is the hoffy, because it has been disturbed. Do you know what LED lamps are like? Will... It work. Yes, it's worked. Is the blue back at a decent intensity? Yes, it's notably brighter. Okay, right. And back over to the glitter lamp, it goes. Oh, that is notably a lot bluer. Right, one moment, I'll show you it actually in position. So that is a good improvement in the blue. I'm not sure how well it's coming across in the video, but there's definitely a lot more blue in the wall. However, as before, it's not as sharp as the red, because the red gallium arsenide chips have a much smaller, sharper point of light as opposed to the gallium nitride chips, and in a way it makes them more suitable to this. Now I'm pondering whether it might be worth actually replacing the blue, or maybe just adapting a new lamp completely, to have red and yellow chips, because the yellow chips, uh, the traditional gallium arsenide ones, will be a lot sharper than the blue. But having said that, this has restored that element of blue to the light and it's made it much more sparkly when it catches your eye as you're sort of working in the vicinity of it in the room. I'd say that's actually a good result.